to you in silence. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. The wilderness will rejoice. The dry land will blossom. The people of God will return with joy and singing. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Christ into the world 
And we look forward to the day when he comes again. So we're in the new advent right now. Now the prophet Isaiah tells us in today's Bible reading that Jesus will bring peace into our world. And he wants us to all live in peace together without waiting. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, today we ask you to help us live in peace with one another. We praise you as we celebrate the coming of our Savior, the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
our Old Testament reading. We turn back to Isaiah this week again, chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. Together, let's listen for the word of the Lord. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, in faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fallen together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hold of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the people. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling place shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I'd like everyone to take a minute and turn to that insert in your bulletins. What it has is four different images of the peaceable kingdom as painted by the early uh, 19th century Quaker named Edward Hicks. Now, it's believed that he painted this over a hundred times, though now only 60 are still in existence. And his different versions take place over more than 30 years apart. And you can see his internal struggle with Isaiah's vision. In 1827, there was a schism among the Quakers. And that split is portrayed in some of the paintings you have there as a tree trunk with a massive split going down the trunk. It also doubles as the stump from which a shoot emerges in Isaiah. Now frequently in his different versions, Hicks portrayed the treaty between William Penn and the Lenape people in 1681 that called for perpetual friendship. His struggle was that even though William Penn was committed to this treaty, the ones who would follow Penn preferred war and violence. As a Quaker, Hicks desperately wanted peace on earth. But over his life, he became more cynical, something that's depicted by the animals in his paintings. Early on, you'll notice. The animals were in joyful company with one another, a leopard lying, barely even acknowledging what would be his prey. But toward the middle and end of his painting career, the animals are tense, tired, even baring their teeth at one another. In one of the paintings you have there, Christ is even holding on to the mane of the lion, restraining it instead of guiding it gently forward. Sadly, Hick said that all the division he saw within his own faith community destroyed his hope of ever seeing the peaceable kingdom established here and now. Hick constantly struggled with this now but not yet reality of our world. Same struggle we find in Christian hope for peace in Christ. It's a 
struggle which we still eagerly or maybe exhaustively await in the second coming of Christ. Think about it. We can all relate to Edward Hicks and his struggle with Isaiah 11. There are few images that are more readily identifiable with our faith than a lion and a lamb laying together. Even though that's not exactly what Isaiah says. But of course, lions are much better images of power than wolves. So we paint the powerful lion laying next to the gentle lamb. And this vision from Isaiah this morning, it really has two distinct parts. The first half is about a branch growing from the roots of a stump, a branch that grows into the Prince of Peace. The people will be judged not by their performative actions or words, but with true righteousness. The Prince of Peace will care for the poor and the meek of the world, and he will rule with righteousness and faithfulness. And then we turn to this beautiful utopian image of wolves living with lambs, leopards laying with kids, calves and lions together, all led by this little child. And for us as Christians, that little child is the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And that's great. What a wonderful image. Look around. How do we even try to understand this prophecy? We are, after all, much more accustomed to violence and fear. Think about this for a minute. There is an entire generation of kids and young adults who know nothing other than war and violence. They have been born, raised, and entered adulthood all in a post-9-11 world, a world defined by attacks, battles, war, and devastation. That is the world we know. That is the world in which we live. That is the world we accept and perpetuate. We cannot begin to imagine peaceable kingdom would even look like. Perhaps that is one reason Hicks painted it so many times, trying to figure out just what a peaceable kingdom would look like in our world. And so he surrounded himself with as many as a hundred possible variations of a peaceable kingdom. The other aspect of this passage that is so challenging is that all of the change happens through divine power, not human action. Isaiah knows that we cannot be trusted to judge with righteousness and faithfulness. Humans always have the ability to judge in ways that give us power over others. Throughout history, people have gone to such extreme lengths to keep and maintain their own power and their grip over others. Yeah, as we look around our world, it is clear that the peaceable kingdom can only come through the power of the divine. So what can we do? Just sit and wait? Isaiah's words are lovely and all, and they're especially powerful for that mysterious future day. But is it possible that his words can speak to us today, right now, while we wait for the divine action to happen. Now, at first glance, it may seem like the answer is a clear no. Hicks, in the 1800s, was hoping for the peaceable kingdom to arrive on earth. Yet here we are, still waiting today. The earliest church was eagerly anticipating the return of the Prince of Peace, and we are still here, waiting today. So is it possible that our only option is to come to church on Sundays, listen to the Word, celebrate the sacraments, and go about our daily lives until the second coming? 
Take a look around the world. Violence, fear, divisions, mistrust that fills our world. So can we really imagine a peaceable kingdom happening in our lifetimes? Each year at this time, we celebrate Advent. We light the candle of peace this morning. We read the words of Isaiah or another prophet proclaiming a new world of peace and righteousness. And here we are again looking around our world in our annual Advent cause before going back to our daily lives on January 2nd. If we think all we can do is wait, that would make sense. We get swept up with the Christmas spirit, but it comes and goes in a month, and we're back to our normal lives. If, however, we believe we can do something, well, that is time to change. Mm -hmm. It's about time for peace. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So listen to Isaiah again. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Now, it might help us to understand Isaiah 11 if we place it alongside the previous chapter. Because just before, in Isaiah 10, the prophet tells us that God will cut down the tallest trees. God will hack down the thickets with an axe, and the Lebanon's majestic trees shall fall. So just before chapter 11, Isaiah has warned the people of God's coming righteous judgment. And then after that judgment, after the tallest trees are chopped down, a shoot will emerge. Peace will come from the unlikeliest place, from a stump thought to be the lifeless remains of a majestic tree. A stump forgotten and ignored. A stump in the backwater town of Bethlehem. A branch that will grow out of the shoot. <coughs> go to Nazareth, proclaiming the coming peaceable kingdom. Isaiah reminds us. Jesus Christ reminds us that the coming kingdom of God will emerge from the unlikeliest of places. Peace will come from the unexpected. Now I believe that we need to hear and understand Isaiah's words today. So over the last three plus years, I've heard numerous times that the church is in decline. Not just us, but all over the country. I've heard we need to do this or do that to bring more people in. I've heard lamentations over the state of the congregation and an inability to grow. I've had those same feelings on occasion. We all have. We all want the church to thrive. But what are we going to do to make it happen? See, we're much more comfortable sitting and pointing at what we think needs to change. What we think the magic elixir will be. But you see, Everyone here this morning, each and every one of us, we are all prophets for our world today. Just like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Hosea, just like all of them. We're called by Christ to proclaim the good news to the poor, to do justice, not just hope for it, to do it. We're called to love kindness. We're called to walk humbly with our Lord. Each of these are actions that we can, actions that we must take each and every day. Because it's far easier to moan about the state of our world, of our church, than it is to change it. As prophets, that is exactly our call. 
You cannot just come here on Sundays, hear a good word, say amen, and go about our lives just as before. If we want to see peace in this world, we must first open ourselves to the transformative power of Christ. <clears throat> and that happens over time. It isn't as simple as becoming a member of a church and sitting back and waiting, pointing but not acting. As called disciple of Christ, prophets for our modern world, we have to go out into this very world and proclaim that message. For instance, when was the last time anyone invited someone to church? Now, to be fair, I do know of one person who's done it recently. But when did you invite a friend or a family member to come to church on Sunday? When was the last time you went into the streets of the city and offered a meal to someone who was hungry? When was the last time you served at a soup kitchen? It's been years for me. Now, before we say, well, we give to charities, which I'm sure many here do, and that is good, Christ tells us it is not enough. We must be in the world with all of God's children. We have to do more than write a check and say it's up to the organization to do the work. Friends, it's up to us. Do we truly want to see the peaceable kingdom that Isaiah proclaims this morning? The one that Edward Hicks spent decades trying to imagine? Or would we rather sit back and live in our current world? Violent and scary as it may be, at least we know what to expect. Because ultimately we are driven by our comforts in the known. I'll be honest, how many of us shuddered at the thought of inviting someone to church? Even a friend, let alone a complete stranger, just isn't something we do anymore. It's much easier to sit on the sidelines and look for problems to nitpick. But today, Isaiah says, enough. Today, Jesus says, enough. Enough complaining without acting. You've heard me say this countless times. Our call as Christians is not meant to be easy. Christianity is hard. Christianity is a lifelong struggle. Our faith is an ever-evolving idea that we must continually work to understand and live into faithfully. Today, we must ask ourselves if we will let that branch grow. Isaiah tells us the Prince of Peace will come from a forgotten stump. Jesus lived a life of the unexpected. So do we want to look at the church, even our church, as a relic of a previous life? Or as a possible stump out of which a shoot can emerge and the miraculous can happen? Will we let that shoot grow into a branch? Will we let the branch grow into an outpouring of Christ's love and desire for all of us? will snuff out any possible light. See, today, we lit the second candle, candle of peace. Will we rush to put these candles out and go about our daily lives, or will we let their light shine in our hearts and in our souls? The answer is obvious. Let the light and warmth of these candles shine and do their work in you. Because ultimately, the peaceable kingdom is coming to earth. God is going to create a new creation from only a small stump. Do we want to be that stump? Because we can be, if and only if we are open to the transformative power of Christ. So there are moments when visions of this future shine forth into our world. We can only see them if we're willing. 
every month when our food pantry gives out badge to those in need, that's letting the light shine from the peaceable kingdom into our world. Next week, when we gather together and collect our baby shower gifts, items for new moms in need, that will be light from the peaceable kingdom shining through into our world. When we fight for justice for those who feel forgotten, that too is light from the peaceable kingdom shining through into our world. So what do we want to do today? Do we only want to come to church, watch the candles be lit, and quickly snuff them out? Do we want to feed them oxygen, allowing them to shine into our hearts, and then carry that light out into the world? It's time to stop wishing we were something else and do something to make it happen. It's up to us the prophets of the modern world. But remember this, the prophets were not content sitting idly and pointing at problems. They worked for it. They shouted it to the world. They claimed the reign of God. So if we want to be the stump from which the peaceable kingdom emerges, we must act. We must share this flickering light of two candles with everyone we encounter this week. We must ask ourselves every day if we are being the stump or if we're trying to snuff out any possible light. <coughs> Friends, today go into the world with conviction in your faith. Walk humbly with God. Do justice. Fight for justice. Love kindness. Let your first thoughts of others be of kindness and love, not judgment and mockery. Be tired of the way things are and live into the way things could be. Wolves and lambs living together. Lions and calves laying together. Cows and bears eating together. All of it is possible if we want it. The peaceful kingdom can start with us, with each one of us here today. Because the Prince of Peace emerges from only a stump. Today, let's choose to be that very stump. Today, let's choose to bring peace to others so we can then experience peace of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our hearts and souls want the peaceable kingdom to be present today. So send your spirit that our words and actions may help make this a reality. Let our hearts be full of your love that we desire peace. Let our minds be full of your wisdom that we know how to bring peace. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, please rise if you're able for hymn number 96 on Jordan's Day for the
of faith using the words of the Nicene Creed printed in your bulletins. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. I do have a couple of prayer requests um, already written out. I got a message from Sue this morning. Um, one, her and Gary are both recovering from COVID, so we're thankful for that. And Sue also sprained her wrist, so we're also praying for her for that as well. Um, from Chris Madison, we're praying for the Fox family at the loss of Christine, his uh, sister in the family. We're also, for Cookie, praying for Michael, continued prayers for him. And we're praying um, for Kate, for the Joseph family, your, your cousin died. Yeah on Monday. So we're praying uh, for you and your family. And I'm going to go ahead and add a whole congregation. It seems to be a lot of uh, coughing and sickness being felt right now. So um, we will go ahead and pray for us that we are able to make it through this winter season. Are there any other joys or concerns? Yeah, Amy. I guess I would say it's just a joy and a joy. But uh, in the next
this nation and for all nations, remembering especially those who are victims of injustice. We pray for elected officials and all leaders that they will govern with courage and equity. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for all in need, for the sick, the destitute, and the dying, for strangers in our land, for the invisible ones, for the elderly and children, for parents and grandparents, for those who live alone and those who live lonely in the midst of family. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We remember with mercy those who sleep without shelter, cold and vulnerable, lacking enough food, those who are overworked and those who have no work. Stir up in us the capacity to see ourselves in their struggles and to act so that others may have life abundance. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy is great. great. We pray for this community, for our neighbors and friends, and for those with whom we study and work. Guide and strengthen all people in our common life to know the gifts of your grace and love. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Today, Lord, we pray especially for Sue and for Gary, for the Fox family, for Michael, for the Joseph family, for all of us who are feeling sick today, for churches around the world, for Denonda. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We give thanks for the saints who have gone before us, asking that our gratitude for their witness be apparent in all that we do. Yes. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. May all that we ask and all that you see is needed in our world be given to your people. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Friends, let us now bring our tithes and our offerings to the God for the nation.
for water and food, for light and darkness, for Jesus, who enlarged our vision, sent himself before us as the bread and wine of abundant life, and for the Holy Spirit, who comes to us in baptism, and moves in our midst with the power to lead us to you. Turn our offerings to your goodwill, and turn us always to your gratitude. Amen. Our next hymn is number 629, Jesus, the very thought of me. <laughs> Feed the hungry, 
to humble the mighty and to announce the good news of your coming land. With thanksgiving, we remember how, when the hour had come, Jesus took his place at the table with the apostles. He said to them, I will not eat this Passover again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. With thanks and praise, we offer ourselves to you, sharing this holy meal, remembering Christ dying and rising and praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Praise to you, Lord Jesus, dying you destroyed our death, rising you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, this bread, this cup, these people. Christ's body and blood given in love for the world. Make us one in the Spirit, one in the church, and one with Christ our Lord. Make us gentle, joyful, thankful people, serving our neighbors, worshiping you alone. Keep us in the peace of Christ until you gather us at your table in glory. Even now, a voice is crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we, many as we are, are one body. For it is of one loaf of which we partake. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? When we give thanks over the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. If you're more comfortable staying in your seat, raise your hand and that's here. Are you going around? Okay.
us pray. Gracious and abundant God, even as we wait for the fulfillment of your creation, you meet us in Christ at this table, in this meal. We thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and quenching our thirst with the cup of salvation. Now send us out into the world by the power of your Holy Spirit to share your life and salvation with all who we meet. Amen. Our final end is number 88. O come, O come, Emmanuel. You guys are lucky. We're only doing the first four verses. Please arise and hear it. Thanks be to God.